I am an assistant professor in the Department of American Ethnic Studies. Um, my day-to-day, -day, I mean like most other professors, is you know, teaching research meetings because that's like most of our life. Um, so usually, so I've been here almost two years, I'm really trying to think about the dynamics between social justice and science, uh, particularly neuroscience. And this project arose out of um, really the summer, so the summer of 2020, after George Floyd and after Breonna Taylor and all of the kind of ways in which it totally, you know, uh, disrupted kind of our society and ways to think about racial justice. One of the things that I've been really interested in is how science responded to that. I mean, I'm a sociologist in American Ethnic Studies, so there's already kind of differences disciplinary that goes on because we all come from different disciplinary backgrounds. And part of like what I'm doing in my research is to try to bring clarity in some ways to sociologists about what neuroscience does and does not do. Same thing as I'm talking with neuroscientists, I'm also trying to bring clarity around what are these social concepts or things that we're talking about. Way race has been used, can be used, race, ethnicity, and a lot of other social categories can be used um, in these um, ways that reinforce, reconstitute existing inequalities, or maybe make new inequalities. Um, what I would argue, though, with neuroscience, and I'm thinking particularly the example in my book, which was looking at neuroscientists who study antisocial behavior, um, is that it's not just about the misuse of, let's say, these variables for social locations, right? It's really easy to look at a, a, a document, look at an article and say, okay, actually this is racist or sexist because of the way that they're using this variable. What's harder is actually to say, what are the kind of systemic impact? How do you deal with the systemic impacts of racism or sexism in your work, right? Because those things, even within society, don't always come up in ways that are like blatant. And so what I'm really trying to think about is how do these things act in a more normative way? There's probably been enough work to show there's some problems with the way in which we do science, build technologies, actually just the production of knowledge in itself, right? There's problems in the ways in which things that we miss, right? And the ways in which these types of technologies, these types of knowledges can then reinforce our existing inequalities. The way most people have dealt with this is through diversity, right? Through diversity, equity, inclusion. I would argue though that, and this is true I think within the academy, that diversity, equity, inclusion has a particular type of goal, right? And that is to increase the number of historically underrepresented or historically marginalized folks into the field. And that does a particular type of work, but there's an assumption that goes along with that work. And the assumption is, that because these new people are coming in the field, all of our problems around race, class, and gender will also be fixed, right? And that's a, that's a pretty bad assumption, thinking that we're all trained in a particular type of way, thinking about social justice and neuroscience. What does an anti-racist neuroscience look like? What do we want it to look like? What would it mean for that type of work to then address larger systemic problems within society, right? And so some of it may mean also thinking about who do we interact with, right? So. So a good example that I've written about before is like thinking about, um, you know, is it anti-racist? Oh, um, can we think about anti-racist ways in which we think about like where the materials for, let's say, like an MRI machine are coming from? Do we make political decisions about like where we actually purchase from, what, who we, what vendors we actually deal with, what institutions we actually, actually deal with, what people, right, in ways that could actually then think about this in a more systemic way and, and much more towards social justice and not just diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right, so during that summer, I was asked to um, participate in um, Black and Neuro. Right, the group who kind of has really has spearheaded like this whole because now it's like black and genetics, it's all these other groups now that have come up. Um, but what made me really interested in them, and this really made me think about this the project that I'm doing now, is like how students and you know trainees right now are thinking about social justice in their work, right? So, you know, these neuroscientists, right, mostly black neuroscientists, but really just a group of neuroscientists, right, young neuroscientists have really thought about 
you know, how do I use my work in a very anti-racist way? So how can I produce a neuroscience that is more anti-racist, that is more in tune to social justice, right? So what I think the answer to kind of this question is that the imagination of these young folks like yourself who are all like going through neuro right now thinking about these issues already right so for you guys there is no kind of like I've never thought about this or I didn't read anything about systemic racism you're already doing things like that now I usually say I you know ended up here by accident like total accident you know like most people with PhDs um, like so I did start out as a biology student I was at the University of Houston and um, my, my last year, like I really had no idea what I wanted to do. So like, like most biology students, I went to the field thinking, oh yeah, I want to go to med school. And by the end of the time, I was like, I do not want to go to med school. Like that's <laughs> not what I want to do. And I had a mentor there um, who has now passed away, um, who, who was really like, okay, so you don't know what you want to do. He was in black studies, but he was like, you know, have you thought about, because I was taking classes in black studies as well, he's like, have you thought about doing maybe a master's in black studies? Um, and then kind of coming back to making this decision about what you want to do after that. Because it was like, it's two years, it's quick, you know, but it gives you like basically something to keep doing and not like go out of academia, right? I was really thinking about, um, medical sociology at the time but then the question that I had that kind of came uh, during my master's was to really think about um, violence as a health problem right so my my thesis that I did was just kind of thinking about kind of the use of race in biomedical research and one of the things I came across was just um, looking at like the leading causes of death the leading cause of death for African-American men, boys, from like 15 to about 35, which is still the thing, same thing today, is homicide, right? So the question I asked then is, why don't we think about homicide as a kind of a health problem, particularly more like a public health problem versus just a criminal justice problem? I originally went to do more research on violence prevention. When I first got into grad school, I was actually going into neighborhoods um, in Oakland and San Francisco, dealing with youth and um, in violence prevention programs. I was at UCSF. I also ran into folks who were in science technology studies. And so that was the first time I had ever heard that you actually can study science from like a sociological or, so, or so, you know, point of view, right? And I was really intrigued. I was like, this is actually like really cool. I end up like just changing my mind while I was there and I was like well what I really want to do is like think about these questions in STS and my mentors um, at the time were really thinking about questions of genetics and race because the Human Genome Project had been sequenced around 2001 or so um, you know this is 2008 or 9 and the question I kept thinking about was that you know, neuroscience was also pretty new in kind of the, the term of things, right? Especially these new neurotechnologies like MRIs and things like that. And that there was very little that had been written on how neuroscientists think about race, right? In fact, I don't think there was really anything, right, about like what neuroscientists, how neuroscientists deal with race in comparison to kind of the work that was coming out of genomics and bioethics, right? And so, that was kind of my question. That was my original question. I wanted to think about how do neuroscientists deal with race. That's not the book I ended up writing. Uh, the book I ended up writing was a little bit different, um, but that was the original question and why you know I chose, particularly chose neuroscientists who were studying antisocial behavior because violence is a very racialized and gendered behavior, and particularly within the U.S. And so, you know, I was like, how could they not deal with these concepts around race? I think what's important about it is the type of small steps. So this reminds me of um, Ruha Benjamin's new book on viral justice, where she just talks about these like micro things that we could do, right, beyond just the grand scale. But there are small steps that we all can do, right, to think about moving toward justice. So a question I think that we could ask for us at UW, right, in particular, because this is a social setting too, is like, you know, what do we want? social justice and anti-racism to look like on this campus, right? And then who are we asking to actually participate in this? Because I think anti-racism requires everybody on campus to buy into it, right? 
Uh, and what would that look like, let's say, for the sciences, right? What would that look like for them to do anti-racist work? Uh, sleep. <laughs> sleep brings me peace. <laughs> sleep. Um, this is, yes, this is one thing I realized is that um, this job, you don't get a lot of sleep. Yeah, you're constantly working. This is a job that you're never off. So, um, sleep, I, yeah, so I try to sleep when I can, which is not often. Uh, and then, I guess what I, what I usually do kind of more recently, um, what do I do? I mean, I watch, I watch sports, so that's usually kind of my off. Uh, I haven't been as active like in the gym, but I use some time I go to the gym. I'm, um, I used to be power lifting, now I'm like, I do Olympic lifting and some CrossFit stuff, so like, that brings me peace. Um, I do Rubik's Cubes, you probably see them like all over my office everywhere. Uh, Sometimes <laughs> I'm just sitting in my office doing a Rubik's Cube. Uh, and reading, um, yeah, I, I, I do like to read. Um, so trying to pick up a book, trying to pick up a non-academic book, that's the hard part. Like trying to pick up like a book outside of academia, right? And our problem, my problem is as soon as I pick up any book, I'm still reading it like an academic book. And I'm like thinking about all these kind of questions, but still it brings me like peace. Mm -hmm.